This is Sazerac Rye Whiskey, which is produced by the Sazerac Company, which is the perfect base spirit for the Sazerac Cocktail, which originated at the Sazerac Coffee House, which is known for exclusively selling a cognac from the Sazerac de Forge Cognac Distillery. Sick of the world Sazerac yet? If you are, this isn't the video for you. If you want to hear more, keep watching. Now, this story can be convoluted from just how many things are named Sazerac, so I will do my best to try and keep things clear. But let's have a glass of this. I have a YouTube short in TikTok that will walk you through the recipe of the Sazerac cocktail. Let's enjoy a little bit of the Sazerac rye. To me, this is just your quintessential rye whiskey. It is really rather smooth and it hints more to, to a bourbon than some other extreme ryes. Highly recommend this. No surprise to anyone who knows New Orleans, but it was originally founded by the French in 1718. Let's begin by sailing back to the French countryside to nearly 100 years before when a family with a Sazerac name began making wine in Eau de Vie, a clear fruit-based brandy in 16th Foley. For over 100 years, they were moving steadily without any changes until a new son, Bernard Sazerac, was born on September 27, 1742. He was born into the middle of the Finsbois sub-region of the French Cognac region in the town of Angoulême. Brief side note, France has a few protected regions for wine and spirits. The French AOC protects the cognac region for its flavor and methods. They have a few crews or groups within a region based on the minerals and soils and grapes used. So it designates a cognac different from just say a generic brandy. Bonald was an enterprising young man and saw the potential of what his family's eau de vie could reach. The communities and distilleries of the time were beginning to get more organized to help each other with international sales. He walked to ungrown his family's estate, and at the age of 39, he bought another estate, Le Jardes de Forge, located in the neighboring town of Monsieur sur bois He also changed his family name to Sazerac de Forge and created a new enterprise through the addition of a papal mail. The papal mail became Bernard's focus, but a few changes did happen on the distillery side, mainly by adjusting the brandy to double distillation and distilling it at higher proof. Bonald died 10 years later, and his wife took over operations just as Bonald wanted, Papal Fulch Distillery II. His son, Laurent, was only 19 when his father passed away, so he learned everything he could from his mother, and within a few years he was running the family estate. But he was confused by his father's actions. The eau de vie and brandy was the real moneymaker, so he transformed a lot of the family's land to vineyards. This allowed them to have enough inventory for international di distribution. The first appearance of the cognac in American Appletite soon was 50 years later in 1849. The Sazerac family stayed in France, but the brandy sailed to the port of New Orleans. The European colonies in America were never peaceful. Slavery was rampant, both for people native to the colonies and for individuals shipped from overseas. The islands of Hispanola, present-day Haiti and Dominican Republic, was originally found by Christopher Columbus. The Spanish took over, just as they did with many other nations in the Caribbean. Eventually, they focused on expansion on the mainland Americas, and the French took rule over some areas of the island. It's eventually split via treaty, with the French receiving the western side of the island in 1697. For over 100 years, tension between the French settlers and people of color grew. Everyone saw what happened with the French Revolution from 1789 to 1799, and the Haitian Revolution was inspired, breaking out in 1791, lasting until 1804, when the French pulled out of Haiti. Napoleon Bonaparte had given up on his American empire by then. France's Louisiana land was sold to the US in 1803, and in 1804, French troops were defeated and withdrew from Haiti. The revolution was bloody. By the end, almost 345,000 people lost their lives. Many French people knew they needed to get out. By 1809, nearly 10,000 French refugees left Haiti and landed in New Orleans. Within these refugees was a man named Antoine M. D. Peychaud. He set up a shop called Pharmacy Peychaud in 1841. The store became well known for bitter opal tonic made from anisette and gentian root. He also had established himself as a member of the Masons, including holding high old titles, and allowed him to spread the popularity of his biddles by hosting the masonry at his pharmacy. He sold his biddles in a glass known as a cockatiel, which some people think is where the term cocktail came from. His recipe was pandan, and the biddles market was growing. Rival Stockton's biddles had published its recipe early on in its life, which led to a number of copycats and fakes on the market. Peixot had better foresight than this. Florida was not the place for Sebel Taylor. He had spent 26 painstaking years before he was done. He bought a ticket for New Orleans without a plan. He landed a job as a ball keep at the Merchants Exchange House. At this time, America was on its switch over from tea being the beverage choice to coffee, and by 1845, he was running the shop. He saw both the store and all of New Orleans grow, and he saw the preference of foreign goods to locally made American ones. 
he decided that the coffee shop should specialize in important products, bringing in new items. One of these items was the Sazerac de Folge Cognac Brandy, which quickly became one of the best sellers. At one point, Taylor tried Peugeot's Biddles, they were Mabel's after all, and decided to solve it at his ball. An old historical belief thought that this is when the modern day Sazerac cocktail was invented, but it was likely not. Taylor saw how his customers would flock for this brandy and knew those money to be made. He switched his attention to managing the importation and selling it on the wholesale and retail markets. One of the bartenders, Andrew Bold, began to take controls of day-to-day -day operations of the coffee house and decided to add a dash of absinthe and a neat flavorful cordial to the cognac. This saw rinsing the glasses with absinthe instead of just adding it directly to the cocktail with a dash. The popularity of the signature drink just grew, and Bold made the decision to rename the coffee house to the Sazerac Coffee House. Bold also opened up a liquor store around the same time. A young transplant from Maryland applied for a job as a shop hand. His name was Thomas Hughes Handy. Handy wasn't new to Orleans at this time. He had moved there from Somerset County, Maryland, when his father was having health problems. And New Orleans was known throughout the country for the pharmacists and apothecaries that supposedly could cure anything. Uh, they couldn't. And his father passed away and he had to drop out of school and become the breadwinner for his family. He took several cloak jobs before he got the chance to learn the liquor business from Bold. The Civil War broke out in 1861 and Handy, being the good Confederate son he was, went to fight. He was stationed at Fort St. Philip, about 80 miles up the river from New Orleans. When attacked by Union soldiers, they struggled with defending it. For 12 days, they fought relentlessly. The Confederates struggled with little food, water, blankets, shelter, and medical attention. Handy was captured and kept as political prisoner in Fort Warren in the Boston Harbor. He was eventually traded back to the Confederacy in a prisoner exchange. But as soon as he returned, the Confederacy put him under arrest for insubordination and mutiny for losing control of Fort St. Philip. Handy was really great with people, and through an impassioned speech, he was able to exonerate himself and rejoin the artillery. This helped spark a fire under Handy, and he led a group of soldiers to stop a Union gunship, the SS Indianola, from disrupting rebel traffic. He and his crew attacked with vigor and disabled the ship. They plundered its cargo and captured the crew. He continued to win several victories against Union ships until he was caught in the file and got an injury in his leg that caused a permanent limp. He resigned from the artillery and returned back to New Orleans just as the Confederates surrendered. While Handy was away, Bold's health deteriorated and sold it to J.B. Schiller, the new importer of Sazerac de Forge brandy. Schiller then expanded the coffee house into the building next door. Handy went back to Bold, who followed him to the coffee house, and Schiller hired him as a clerk. Schiller's health also was beginning to deteriorate and he was looking to sell it. Handy riled up a few co workers and together they bought the coffee house. Handy's leadership and Vigor appeared here and he took over everything Schiller was doing. He became the sole importer in New Orleans for Sazerac de Forge Cognac. He was seeing the business grow and he was getting cocky. Along the way, Handy formed a good kinship with Peugeot. Peugeot now trying to retire close to its apothecary shop in 1870. He entered in business with Handy, where his importing business now entered the manufacturing business through the production of Peugeot's Biddles. Handy's taste of success was something he didn't think would ever end, so he was trying to massively grow his wealth. He invested in railroads, which ended poorly. By 1787, he lost most of his money. He then sold the Sazerac Coffee House and Poland business to Vincent Mikas, trying to maintain his hold on Peugeot Biddles, but Mikas was under the impression that came with everything else. It ended up as a Biddle legal battle, and Handy's ego made him lose again. Mikas won ownership of Peugeot's. Mikas was also unlucky. He lost a lease to the Sazerac House and the original building was destroyed. The remaining money he did have, he opened up the old Sazerac Ballroom in Lickle Stall a few streets away. And he had learned something from his failures. He was saving his money and decided to rebuild the Sazerac Coffee House in its original location in 1882. Handy's place then became the place to get a Sazerac. This ate into Mika's business. He was unable to rebuild his finances and after 20 years of fighting with Handy over customers, he gave up. He moved to Bordeaux, France and sold everything to one of his employees, Theodore Bodman. Handy's success finally came and he was basking in the glory. But across the ocean, a tiny problem was emerging. A little small parasitic insect somehow made its way to Europe and into France. It was first recalled in 1863 by Jules Le Planchon. He saw something that looked like lice on the dying vines, sucking the sap and life from the plants. It seemed to be similar to an American insect discovered in 1855 by Asa Fitch. After a few years, it was confirmed this bug, now called Phylloxia, did indeed come from the Americas. But cure was still needed. The French government offered a reward of 300,000 francs, a value of around 183,000 USD today. Over 600 suggestions were offered. Chemicals and pesticides weren't working. Some growers released toads into the vineyards in hopes that they would kill the insect. 
no luck on any of those. Some entomologists theorize that grafting, or joining tissues of different plants together to grow together, would help. Several viticulturists sent rootstock that were resistant to the bug, which helped stabilize the French wine industry, although not a full solution. The blight lasted nearly 15 years, a drop from 84.5 million hectoliters to 234 million. Its effects were felt worldwide in both the world of wine and French brandies. Sazerac de Forge et Fleur's cognac would stop being produced. It was impossible to get any cognac at a reasonable price. Handy has lost his namesake, and he needed a replacement to satisfy the thirst of his customers. He joined to rye whiskey. The rye introduced more spice notes compared to the cognac's fruity and floral taste. It was a change that the public loved. It allowed the Sazerac house to stay on top and become known on a national scale. A must stop on any visit to New Orleans. And he began to work on ready to drink cocktails, but he died in 1893 before the project would finish. Willie McCoy, one of Handy's investors, wasn't going to let this strong brand die with Handy. He launched six bottled cocktails in 1899, although Pierre's one matching Sazerac cocktail was not it. At the same time, Billy Wilkinson took over as the Ball's whiskey cocktail specialist. Their in house cocktail began to resemble not more of an improved whiskey cocktail. With the help of Handy's widow, they decided to create a new company and trademark the Sazerac cocktail. Thomas H. Handy and Company. Meanwhile, a formal secretary of Handy sees McCoy's success. He buys Handy's business rights and creates a company called the Sazerac Company. He saw that the preference for the Sazerac cocktail is rye whiskey and released his own rye. And at some point by 1919, something happened between these two companies. I don't know if it was a merger, or buyout, or whatever, but they became the same company. Meanwhile, the temperance movement was growing. It feels like a trend on this channel. By 1920, prohibition occurred. Alcohol was illegal. They decided to stay out of the alcohol business and instead planned to manufacture, buy and sell groceries, candy, soft drinks, dairy products, and even operate a few restaurants. Not all of these plans came to fruition and only a deli and French restaurant were ever created. They survived prohibition and as soon as it ended, they went back into the liquor business by diving into manufacturing and wholesale. They opened a new headquarters, a new bottling facility, and a bar, all in New Orleans. They renewed the trademark Philo Sazerac cocktail and began producing it and bottling it in-house. They continued to grow and become a big distributor in the South for a variety of liquors. They acquired a rectifiers license to blend and bottle liquor made by other distilleries. They created a big advertising campaign for the Sazerac cocktail, which is now only available at their bar in New Orleans. The domination continued and soon it really becomes a story of acquisitions. In 1948, the Logel Magnolia Liquor Company bought the Sazerac Company to complement the fledgling wholesale business. The following year, they bought J.M. Legendary & Co also New Orleans based, who is best known for making an anise flavored liquor. Even past prohibition absinthe was illegal. A chemical called thujon was believed to be the cause of hallucinations and seizures associated with absinthe. Modern evidence supports some of these claims around seizures, but not the psychedelic effects. In both the US, Canada, and the EU, thujon levels are regulated, with the United States being the most strict. Hope Saint, despite having a similar flavor profile to absinthe, lacked the essential ingredient of Grand Wormwood, which contains thujon. When, when creating this liqueur, the Federal Alcohol Control Administration allowed it, but not its original name of Legendary Absinthe. Instead, they renamed it to Legendary Hope Saint, both referring to Hope Saint, which means sacred hulb, spelling in a way as an anagram to absinthe. A new Sazerac ball was also opened in 1949, this time in the Roosevelt Hotel. The Sazerac name was licensed by Seymour Weiss, the owner of the Roosevelt Hotel. It was a beautiful bar with elegant Art Deco coals, walnut panels, and full Paul Nino's murals. Weiss wanted to make a splash with his opening. Balls were men only, with the exception of one day a year, Molly Gras. But Weiss wanted to change that. He announced in a public forum that the bar would be open to women. On the opening day, September 26, 1949, Women dressed to the nines into the bar and oiled the classic drink. The bar was completely packed with women three rows deep trying to get a taste. Saw the trend of more balls opening for co-ed operation. Despite being a publicity stunt, it opened a lot to the women of New Orleans and has now become an annual event at the Roosevelt Hotel. But the Sazerac's cocktail popularity was diminishing. Some locals would enjoy it and some adventurous tourists would try it, but splashy old drinks like the Hurricane were taking over the city's attention. The Sazerac Company, though, kept growing. In 1952, the Sazerac Company launched Taka Vodka, one of the first vodkas to be sold and manufactured in the United States. A few years later, they finally acquired Peixote's Biddles and started manufacturing them. However, they weren't selling too well and were really only available in the New Orleans area. After all, Sazerac's distribution at the time was only regional. 
When the 80s came, consolidation became involved in the local industry. Sazerac was focused on nationwide expansion and distribution. In 1985, they purchased a few brands from Joseph E. Seagram & Sons, Benchmark Bourbon, James Fox Canadian Whiskey, Nicoli Vodka, Kostal's Blended Whiskey, Crown Roos Vodka and Gin, Dr. McKilligatti's Fireball Whiskey, and Eagle Rare. In 1992, they acquired the Frankfort, Kentucky-based Leestown Company and George T. Stagg Distillery from Shenley Distilleries. I have a whole video about E.H. Taylor, an integral man in the history of the George T. Stagg Distillery, which you can watch over here. In 1994, they acquired Manzio Henry, a wine and spirits importer that handled brands like Stalinshnia, Russian Vodka, and Bell Scotch. In 1999, they rebranded the George T. Stagg and Leestown Company Distilleries as the Buffalo Trace Distillery, with the launch of the flagship Buffalo Trace Bourbon. They also bought the W.L. Weller brand. In 2002, they collaborated with the Van Winkle family to begin producing Old Rip Van Winkle on behalf of the family. In 2003, they bought the A. Smith Bowman Distillery in Virginia and got the Bowman Brothers brands. In 2006, Sazerac finally launched a new version of the namesake, Rye, is actually this one. The other ones seem to have been discontinued because of prohibition. In 2009, they bought some of Constellation Brands' Kentucky properties. They got control of Bald in 1792 Distillery in Baldstown and the Glenmore Distillery in Owensboro. They also acquired the old Taylor brand from Beam Global Spirits and Wine. In 2009, Sazerac acquired nearly 50 new brands from Colby Distillery and White Rock Distillery. These deals include the old Montreal Distillery and the Caribou Crossing brand. By 2012, they acquired even more brands from White Rock Distillery and Grand Gala Orange Liqueur from Stock Spirits. 2014, they bought a bottling plant in Lewiston, Maine. 2015, they acquired Michael Collins Irish Whiskey. They also bought Van Gogh Impulse that year, renamed it to 375 Polk Avenue Spirits, and left it as an independent subsidiary. In 2016, they acquired even more brands, including Stella Comfort and Tuaka from Brown Fullman. High Spirits, Paddy Irish Whiskey and Fritz Vodka from Ponold Recalled, The Last Drop Distillery, Southern Trade International, The Popcorn Sun Distillery in Newport, Tennessee, and the Burrell de Zignosiac Cognac Distillery. This distillery would go to release a new version of the Sazerac de Forge and Fields Cognac. In 2017, they ended an agreement with Middlemans. In 2018, they bought 19 brands from Diageo, including Seagram's VO, 83, Five Stalls, Maya Rum, Papa Vodka, Strains, and more. 2020, they bought Oli Times and Canadian Mist from Brown Fullman. Lots and lots of acquisitions. They own over 450 brands, but are somehow still not in the top 10 largest local brands. They're still family run and privately owned. 2010, they opened up a new version of the Sazerac House. It's now a three story Vistle Central where guests can learn about the history of the Sazerac cocktail process of how the wine whiskey is made, despite the fact it's made at the Buffalo Trace Distillery in Kentucky and not New Orleans, and participate in tastings. What's your favorite product from the Sazerac company? I know several people can cite some great stuff that Buffalo Trace makes, so I'm curious what's your favorite? Is there any cocktails you like to make with them, or any variations on the Sazerac cocktail you like to make? I would love to hear all of that about those in the comments below, and feel free to subscribe while you're at it. My name is Zachary, thank you for watching Behind the Bottle, and cheers.